Thank you so much to Ron Klain for joining us. Uh, Ron was the Ebola response coordinator in 2014 and a longtime Biden uh, advisor. So jumping in uh, to kind of more recent events, uh, in the last few days, we've seen Trump launch attacks on Twitter, not just on the platform, but on yeah. Twitter itself, on yeah. Obama and Biden, on China, on protesters in Minnesota and around the country. Is this whole scorched earth policy basically him giving up on undecided voters and, and going all in on his base? I mean, what is the political upside here? Yeah. You know, I learned it's very hard to try to understand Donald Trump and understand his motivation. I think uh, oftentimes uh, because he won this surprising victory in 2016, we see him as some kind of genius who has a master right. plan and all these things. You know, I think he's just a very erratic, chaotic, incompetent leader. And so, uh, you know, I don't know necessarily there's some big political strategy behind the kind of things we've seen from him in the past few days. Uh, I think a lot of it's just an air of desperation as he continues to fall behind in the race, as events continue to spiral out of control. Um, he's not running in the kind of circumstance he thought he was going to be running in. We have uh, obviously incredible uh, you know, disruption in our country, economic losses, uh, issues of racism coming back to the surface. And so I think, you know, it, I think his reaction to it may, may be strategic. Maybe there's some secret plan here, Brian, but maybe it's just an incompetent, chaotic, erratic president being incompetent, chaotic and erratic as he's been all three years. So with that said, I, I want I do want to uh, switch gears here and talk a little bit about the sure. pandemic. Yeah. Um, so my first question is, how did you manage to leave Trump broken tests for a virus that wouldn't even come into existence for three more years? Because that is just, I mean, it's impressive to say the least. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. Um, most presidents, when they face a crisis, they step up to it. I mean, put aside ideology and politics and your approach, but most presidents, they get a crisis thrown in their lap. They say, I'm going to step up to this. I'm going to try to tackle it. I'm going to, you know, really show leadership. And what Trump has done, as you alluded to, is just really wake up every day and figure out who other than him he can blame for his mistakes. And that includes blaming us for leaving him broken tests for a disease that didn't yet exist when we left office. Blaming China, which does deserve some blame here, no question about it. WHO, which isn't perfect. But but, but, I mean, it's just an endless effort by Trump to tweet away a virus that needs an active, aggressive government response. Right. And, you know, and, th and that's what we expect our presidents to do. I mean, uh, and instead, what happened here? Look, what, what really happened here? What really happened here was the warning signs were clear in late December and January that there was a problem in China. The president was busy chasing his trade deal with the Chinese and silenced people in his administration who wanted to raise alarms about this so he could get his trade deal with the Chinese government. But once he got it, he wanted to celebrate it. And so he was busy slathering praise on President Xi at a time when he should have been asking hard questions to President Xi about what was going on in China. The president was busy tweeting out in late January that China had it under control and all Americans owed a debt of thanks to President Xi. That was his position. When we really could have done something about it. We could have gotten eyes on the ground in China to find out what was really going on there. How and big we did have eyes on on the ground in China, yeah. by the way, which I, I think you know it's 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 easy to get for that information to get lost amid all the you know the barrage of of yeah. of, of our news cycle. But but we had we had you know pandemic response offices and that that were closed in thirty nine out of forty nine countries, including China, which in retrospect, not the best move. Not the best move, right? Not the best move to shut down the PREDICT program, which is what you're talking about, a program we started in the Obama administration. Not the best move. We, we, we negotiated and got, as part of that PREDICT program, the right to put an official inside the Chinese Disease Control Agency. The U.S. government had that right. President Trump left that position vacant. Not the best move to shut down the Pandemic Preparedness Office that we created inside the National Security Council in the Obama administration, and that President Trump uh, and John Bolton shut down uh, in uh, 2018. So a lot of not the best moves that would have made us much better positioned to deal with this when it came. Yeah. So actually, with regard to China, so I, I, I do want to say, 
Um, I, I know that Trump is blaming China because he needs a scapegoat. Uh, and I don't want to validate those attacks. But with that said, there, there clearly were suppression efforts in China. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't, um, that doesn't absolve Trump of responsibility, but it does exist as a separate issue. So what, what do we do with regard to China from here? Is there, is there punishment, retribution? Is this a, you just chalk it up to a learning experience? I think, Brian, you're exactly right on this. We need to separate two issues. One, did China mislead and did China cover up uh, what was going on here? Yes. And that's China's fault. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But of course, that was true for the entire world. And so the next question we have to ask ourselves is, China did handle this the wrong way. But then how come there are just hundreds of people dead in Korea, which is much closer to China, and over 100,000 people dead in the United States on the other side of the planet? How come there the disease is over in New Zealand, which again is much closer to China, and yet we're still in the midst of a raging pandemic here in the United States? So China did wrong things, and then President Trump blew the response. And we should never let him use the first of those to absolve himself of blame for the second of those. Other countries found ways to fight the disease, notwithstanding China's problems. Right. We have I, think, I, I think he's under the impression that we, that we live in a vacuum and <laughs> we're the only country that experienced this. When in reality you have you know, he keeps on bragging about how many other countries in the world because he's trying to, you know, diffuse responsibility off of himself. He's saying, look, 184 other countries around the, around the world have dealt with this same virus. If you look at those other countries, you'll yeah. realize that they've all responded or most of the members, maybe with, with the exception of, of Brazil and a few other countries that also have, you know, far right, hardline nationalist leaders. They've all responded well to this. So we don't live in a vacuum and we, we have the luxury, you know, of uh, relatively speaking, of being able to to point to countries like Germany and New Zealand and Australia and you know uh, Canada, <laughs> right, right, right next door, you yeah. know, countries yeah. all around the world, and and sh and and show how they've responded properly to this to this virus. You know, yeah. I think what North, South Korea had uh, had zero cases. You know, the, the, <laughs> on the same day that we that we you know have yet again had uh, between five hundred and a thousand. Yeah, no, I think that's right, Brian. And look, I, to go back to your China question, I do think we need to take strong measures um, uh, against China. I, I, you know, we need to, to really uh, demand clear answers and we need to figure out what the right response is. I think part of it also is increasing pressure on China to finally and completely give up these wet markets where these diseases can spread. It's not just COVID, where it's still not exactly clear where it came from. But we know the SARS virus started in a wet market in China. So I think that's one other area where we need to increase pressure on the Chinese to change their practices. And, and there needs to be a, a tough reckoning on this. I'm absolutely for a tough reckoning on this. But that tough reckoning against China, which the whole world should be involved in imposing, uh, doesn't change the fact that our government, led by President Trump, badly bungled their response here. And there are a lot of Americans who are dead as a result. Yeah. So the virus will still be here in January of 2021. So what would a President Biden do on day one uh, of taking office with regard to this pandemic? What, what is the, the, the top priority? Yeah. So look, obviously part of it depends a little bit on exactly where we are in January of 2021. But I think there are two things that are really, three things I should say that are really clear that would be top priorities from the start. The first is we still don't have a national testing strategy. You know, Brian, sometimes, you know, I talk about this, people say, oh, you're criticizing testing, that's horrible, should have been fixed, but, you know, uh, you, why are you talking about January and February? You and I are having this conversation, you know, at the end of May, right on the brink of June, we still don't have a national testing strategy in the United States. We still don't have uh, an assurance that every American who needs a test can get one. Uh, we still don't have a process for doing that. Uh, Vice President Biden's laid out his... Uh, views on this and a long explanation of how we do it, that's a very, very important thing. We also don't have a national contact tracing strategy. It's a little more obscure to people, but it's just as important. What we need to do is test to see who has the virus and then isolate chains of transmission. That's how public health people, how epidemiologists fight and beat epidemics. It's how we beat Ebola in 2014 and 2015. It's how we've beaten other epidemics before. Testing and tracing. 
And so I think those really are at the top of the list of things that if they aren't fixed by January of 2021, uh, uh, President Biden would have to fix. We're going to also need to really accelerate the development and distribution of uh, possible drugs to treat the disease, hopefully a vaccine sooner rather than later. That's also at the top. And then I think we're also sadly going to have a giant economic problem still lingering around in January of 2021. As we reopen the economy, some jobs will come back. There's no question about it. Trump will brag about that. But a lot of Americans have lost their jobs and they're not coming back just by putting an open for business sign up on the front door. And so Vice President Biden will be announcing soon a comprehensive economic plan to uh, create jobs, not just to bring all the old jobs back, but to make new jobs, building a better economy, stronger economy, more resilient economy, a greener economy. And, you know, I think that's going to be near the top of the agenda when he takes office uh, next January. This current administration is basically paying no mind to the human toll. They're opening the economy for the sake of reopening the economy, right? So yeah. how does a Biden administration reconcile reopening the economy with with the possible loss of life? Or does yeah. Joe just, you know, log on to Twitter and demand that Michigan be liberated, you know? Yeah, I think I don't think that will be his approach. Look, <laughs> one thing about Joe Biden is he's relied on expert advice on this all the way along. You know, he uh, called out Trump on this epidemic in late January, published an op-ed in January 27th, while Trump was still saying there was no disease or it was a hoax or whatever. Biden was saying, hey, this is a problem. We need to deal with it. He was calling him out in February, and he's you know used solid scientific expertise all the way along on reopening. So I'm, uh, I'm assuming he'll he'll uh, he'll bring in Jared Kushner for for the yeah these exactly. Tough jobs. Jared Kushner really sorts the whole thing out. Look, I think on reopening we need to. It's happening, but but you know when I talk to people, Brian, when I talk to people who own stores, when I talk to people who are going back to work, what they all say to me is, "There's just no plan. We don't know what we're supposed to do." We're told we're supposed to open. We don't know, really know uh, how the workers should should be protected. Should they wear gloves? Where they're supposed to stand? Should we put up plexiglass shields? What's safe? What isn't safe? There's just no plan. It's the same chaos that we've seen through this whole thing. And so one thing Joe Biden would do is he would have a plan. He would have his Occupational Safety and Health Administration issue standards for how workers can be safe. Who needs gloves? Who needs masks? Who needs plexiglass shields? How far apart should people be? How should stores run? So on and so forth. He'd issue those standards and he'd make sure those standards were enforced so we keep workers safe, right? And so we keep obviously consumers and shoppers safe. I think this is the craziest thing about Trump's approach, which is if you really want the economy to come back, you should be emphasizing safety more than right. anything else. You well, can it, tell people, put up open signs, but consumers aren't going to shop unless they feel safe. You, this is an economy. We're a free economy. People aren't going to go to restaurants and stores unless they feel like they're going to be safe there. And by right. Trump saying, I don't care about safety, he's, he's putting Americans at risk and he's also hurting the economy. And, and I think that's the most ironic thing about all of this is that, you know, we're in a situation where we have an election coming up in November we need the I mean, Trump needs the economy to, to be restarted more than anyone. The way to do that is to, you know, instill confidence is to make sure that people feel safe going outside. And they're not going to do that if our entire approach to the global pandemic sweeping across the country that's killed more than 100,000 Americans is to pretend that it doesn't exist while yeah. friends and family and neighbors and, and doctors and nurses are dying. You know, I mean, you can pretend that it's not happening, but that doesn't change the fact that it's happening. He really stands to benefit the most from taking an right. aggressive approach, and that's not what he's taking. And, and it just goes to show that his entire strategy all along from the very beginning of his presidency is just to tackle these PR crises one day at a time without any regard to what's happening You know, more than 24 hours in the future. Well, I think that's in a short period of time, probably the best summary of the Trump presidency I've ever heard, Brian. I mean, I think you've got it exactly I'll right. I'll take it. <laughs> you should take it it's spot on. And look, I mean, you know, what's what's really ironic here is when I took over as the Ebola response coordinator, one of the first people I sat down with, of course, was Dr. Tony Fauci, who was at that time the head of, had the same job he has now, head of the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Disease. And Dr. Fauci has been in that job so long. He was one of really one of the key people in launching the fight against AIDS in this country and and really doing some of the critical work in taking on HIV AIDS. And what he told me he learned in fighting HIV AIDS that was true with Ebola, that's true now is 
that when you try to tell people there's nothing to be worried about, there, there's just no risk, no one needs to be scared, when you try to deny it, what you're really doing is you're making people more scared because you're denying something that's obviously true to them. Okay, And that's been Trump's problem all throughout this. We were very careful in the Ebola response to have President Obama say very clearly, look, there are risks here. This is what we're doing to deal with them. But there, there are risks and they're real. And this is what we have to do to, to try to minimize those risks. The more Trump stands up there and says, nothing to worry about, nothing to see here, the more people know, hey, he's lying. There is something to worry about. And the more people get even more scared and more anxious and more frozen about what to do, what's safe, what's not safe. I mean, I, I, I'm sure this is true for everyone who works on this. I get calls every day, all the time, from people in all walks of life who are just confused because they know the president is lying to them, and they don't know what they should believe. They don't know what they should right. do. And, 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 and in that way, his blink at it, tweet at it, lie about it strategy is not helping even his own objectives. It's certainly not helping our country. It certainly cost us a lot of lives. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you see that confusion kind of kind of manifest in the fact that people from around the country are reporting a surge in calls because, you know, from poison control centers because Trump said injecting disinfectant and all of a sudden people go searching for Lysol in their house. You know, he mentions chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and we're not all doctors. So we don't know that when, you know, something has the word chloroquine, chloroquine phosphate in it that we can't ingest it because not everybody went to Johns Hopkins. You know what I mean? So, I mean, these are, these are risks you run and he even sees, he even sees the, the, you know, the consequences of this in real time and does it again and does it again and does it again. And, and, you know, all it, it's, the worst part is that it kind of does undermine the integrity of the office and the ability for people in the future to be able to even trust a government's response to something that the government needs to be able to respond to. Because if not the government, then who? Exactly, Brian. And one other, I agree with all that, and I'd add one other thing to it, which is that sooner or later, we will have a vaccine or perhaps multiple vaccines. And people are going to have to have confidence that they should take them. And the president's erratic leadership, the his recommendation instead of hydroxy and of other bizarre things like UV lights in the body and you know disinfectants, all these things, are going to make people skeptical about that vaccine. You know, like is it any better than anything else he's recommended? And and here's the problem with that. I mean, aside from, you've been through all the problems with people doing wrong things, but here's the other special problem with that. I think it's something people don't really realize. For a vaccine to work, it's not enough that you and I take it. We need almost everyone to take it. it your protection comes not just from you being vaccinated. It comes from your fellow citizens being vaccinated and having broad population immunity to the disease. Right. And if we're in a situation where because of the existing anti-vaccine movement already, plus this crazy skepticism Trump's created in the world about all these things, that 25 or 30% of Americans refuse to take this vaccine when it's available, then we won't have the kind of population-wide immunity we need to really be protected. So th there's gonna be a lasting legacy of skepticism and confusion from Trump's failures here. And whether Trump is president when the vaccine comes or Joe Biden's president when the vaccine comes, people will lack confidence in that because of all the misinformation that Trump has put out. And that's gonna be a real challenge for getting vaccine compliance. Having you know a sizable portion of the population, like let's say 30% of the population, 40% of the population, Trump's base, so to speak, if they refuse to get a vaccine or, or if a large swath of the population doesn't get the vaccine, is there a possibility that the virus could mutate um, enough that even those who have been vaccinated are then again put at risk? Well, it doesn't even have to mutate. I mean, that is, we uh, vaccines don't fully protect you. Vaccines are always partial and imperfect. They're always a critical tool. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to talk down vaccines. I'm talking up vaccines. Right. But when we say we're protected from being vaccinated, what that really means is we're protected because everyone's vaccinated. And that really snuffs out transmission of the disease. Even without any mutation, even without any changes, if we still have 25 or 30% of the population unvaccinated in a vaccinated environment, all of us, even those of us with vaccine, will be at risk of the potential uh, of exposure because the virus will still be spreading around in our society and the incomplete 
protection the vaccine provides uh, won't fully protect us. And so uh, vaccines are part of a public health response. Vaccines aren't some kind of individual health response. They're part of a public health response. They help snuff out a disease because they block transmission of the disease, not just in you, but between you and other people, essentially. And, um, and, if, and the vaccine, and if that doesn't happen, and the vaccine and the virus is spreading wildly, uh, then it's going to spread. We saw this uh, with measles in the, particularly in 2017, 2018, when we had uh, these incidents in local populations, where people stopped getting immunized for measles because of these local vaccine resistances. It wasn't just the um immunized that got measles. There were people who had taken uh, the precautions and still got measles because again, these, we, we really need everyone to be protected or nearly everyone, not everyone, but nearly everyone. Finally, one last thing on this. There are always with every vaccine, Brian, some people who can't take the vaccine for med truly medical reasons. Something about the vaccine has a, a negative reaction to their particular uh, conditions, right? There's always and some people with certain kind of health. Our responsibility right? is to keep those people safe then. And the only way we can keep those people safe is by those of us who can take the vaccine, taking the vaccine. They're counting on yeah. us to snuff out the virus, transmission of the yeah. virus. Yeah, it's a good point. During Ebola, you, you actually expressly opposed the travel ban, whereas that's the only move that Trump took. And in fact, it's, it's May, we've been hearing about this same move since January. I mean, you can't, yeah. you know, you, you can't go more than 12 minutes um, listening to Trump without him talking about the China ban. So can you speak a little bit on that? Because these were, I mean, these approaches couldn't, couldn't be more, uh, couldn't be more different in kind of, if, you know, if, 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 if you tried, which doesn't surprise me from, you know, ver well, from a Trump to an Obama situations. administration. Yeah. So there are different situations. So, it, so, uh, and they require different reactions. With Ebola, we uh, had a different circumstance, which was first, there are very few travelers who came from West Africa to the United States, just a couple hundred a day. And what we did, what we were able to do, uh, we put in place a system to track every single one of those people. So if you came to this country from West Africa, we identified you when you arrived in customs, we gave you a cell phone, we called you twice a day, we got your temperature twice a day, and we were able to identify every single one of those people. I got a report on my desk every day for every single traveler from West Africa who was in this country for the 21 days of possible exposure and their condition validating that we had uh, validated they did not have Ebola that day, twice a day, every day. That was the kind of complete control we had on this, right? Now that worked for Ebola because with Ebola, until you have a fever, you aren't infectious. So we were able to have that system. Now, why did we do that? We did that because it was important to keep travel going because we had to send people to West Africa to fight the disease. We had to send doctors and nurses and all kinds of people to West Africa to fight the disease because the way we were gonna be safe in the US was by beating the disease over there. And so to, to have the planes go, they had to go both ways. We had to have travelers both ways. That's what we did. That was our approach. It was the right approach. Uh, it largely, it ultimately led to us helping with the people of West Africa themselves, helping to end the Ebola epidemic there and protected the American people. We had a solid tracking program. Now, what has Trump done instead? First of all, uh, he acted, he, he likes to boast that he acted quickly on China travel restrictions. Uh, 45 other countries imposed Chinese travel restrictions before we did. Okay, so he wasn't fast. He was after 45 other countries. He always had a lot of exemptions to the travel restrictions. So even when he put on these travel restrictions, thousands of people still came from China after the restrictions were put in place. American citizens could come back and forth, as they should, of course. But right. also, Chinese crews on planes and boats bringing products, commercial products, were allowed to come back and forth. He didn't want to cut off. He just got in this trade deal with China. He didn't want to cut it off. He wanted all the technology flowing back and forth, so on and so forth. So thousands of people continued to come here. That's why I said in early February, this wasn't really a travel ban. It was a travel band aid. Trump's position was, I put on these travel restrictions. We're safe. I don't need to do anything else. When instead, what I was saying in early February was, he, hey, You've slowed the introduction of the disease by restricting some travelers, not all, some, good, step in the right direction, but you need to use this time in January and February to get testing ramped up, to get protective gear to hospitals, 
to do the things you need to do. And I also said, you need to start to monitor and track those travelers. They did none of those things. They just boasted about this travel restriction and then assumed they had solved the problem. That was Trump's position. I put on this travel ban, that's gonna go away, you know? And that was the mistake here. It wasn't a mistake to try to squeeze down travel from China. That was, I think, the right thing to do uh, when Trump did it. Uh, but we had to recognize, the problem with what Trump did was he didn't recognize the disease was already here. He didn't use any time it bought to ramp up testing. He didn't use any time it bought to ramp up contact tracing. He didn't use the time it bought to protect our hospitals. And those are the critical failures. Those 70 days in January, February, and early March that we lost, that has accounted for so much of the death and devastation we've seen. And it's kind of par for the course for a Trump presidency uh, that is solely focused on, you know, I mean, this is a branding, this is a marketing presidency, right? Trump does one little thing, you know, he, you know, He'll he'll take the whatever the easiest move that he could possibly come up with, does that, and then sells it for yeah. for in this case seventy days. When when what yeah. you need is not a salesman pitching you a you know a garbage product for for seventy days that didn't do the trick, you need you need somebody to actually do the work. And I think that's what he you know doesn't want to do. Yeah. And that kind of shows itself in in the fact that you know. All we're getting is is hail marys for miracle cures. You know that's why we have that's why he's pushing so hard for hydroxychloroquine because it's easy yeah. because it already exists and that's and that's evidence in the way that he talks about it. He even says you know the FB, FDA has approved this thing. It's been it's been around forever. Well, so then it's obviously safe. But but it's just a testament to the fact that it's easy. It's already done. He want, he doesn't even want the FDA to, FDA to have to test any drugs. This yeah. one already exists. Granted, it's not for a coronavirus. It's for <laughs> malaria you know yeah. uh but but that's a little you know that's of little importance to him yeah you know it's it's such a great observation brian that um this is a hard problem i mean let me start there right fighting this disease is a hard problem there's no question about it and it would have been a hard problem for any president but what i learned with ebola is that um you know these hard problems require a lot of hard work i mean we worked hard president obama worked hard on ebola we, we got some things right, we got some things wrong, we learned, we adapted along the way. But you know, we, we had 13 agencies working around the clock. We you know, did everything from sending troops to West Africa to building test kits in the US to ramping up hospitals, all these things. There were hundreds and hundreds of measures we took. And the, the problem with Trump and this, as you say, is that his whole thing is, is I wanna do one thing and it's a magic bullet and it's gonna solve it. The travel ban was a magic bullet. And then, uh, you know, hydroxy was a magic bullet. And then for a little while, for a few weeks, remsidesivir was going to be a magic bullet. And then, uh, you know, now he's talking about uh, Operation Warp Speed and the vaccine will be a soon and magic bullet. Uh, or, or just generally pretending it was going to go away. Uh, uh, April was the magic bullet. It was going to get warm in April. It would go away like a miracle, you know. Well, as you know, we we all packed the churches in Easter and everything was fine. The church with Easter, the all these things. You know, and, and as you say, I think this is such a critical point about Trump's leadership. He doesn't have the real determination and the vision and the, frankly, willingness to work hard to do the job of president. And in some ways, he's been a very lucky president that that hasn't really caught up to him fundamentally until now. But it has caught up with him fundamentally until now. And, and right. you know, we're, we're all paying the price for the fact that the guy walks into a room, uh, picks on one solution, uh, tries to market it, tells people that's it. And that's not how you're going to beat something as hard and as difficult. And look, same thing goes on the economy. Like, it's the same thing. On the economy, he's got a one-point plan. Reopen. That's the one-point plan. Right. Uh, right. Ignore the fact that a lot of businesses are closed and not reopening. A lot of jobs are lost, not come back. Just reopen, reopen, reopen. That's the whole thing. That's not going to do it. Again, that's going to take a lot of hard work, a lot of planning, a lot of details, a lot of, of creativity. And we're just not going to get any of that from Donald Trump. Do you have a, a most memorable day from the Obama-Biden administration? Well, from the entire administration, certainly the most memorable day for me uh, came when I was the Ebola response coordinator. And in late February, mid-February, I should say, uh, we had gotten the disease very substantially under control in West Africa. It wasn't totally wiped out, but we were down to literally five cases a week in the entire, all three countries in Africa. And President Obama made a decision that we would bring home our troops that we'd sent over there to help with the response, Operation United Assistance. And we had an event at the White House 
where he made that announcement. He announced he was going to bring our troops home. And we had with us uh, almost all of the Americans who had uh, contracted Ebola while fighting the disease in West Africa. They came to the White House that day. And after the president gave his speech and, and thanked each of them, we had a, a private meeting with them, the team that was leading the Ebola response at the White House and all these people who had contracted the disease in, in the U.S. or contracted in Africa, mostly in, in Americans who contracted in Africa fighting the disease. And we sat around a table. We spent just hours talking with them. And, and you know, it was just so emotional. What was really struck me about it, Brian, was uh, on one side of me, when we had this meeting uh, was Kent Brantley, who was a evangelical doctor. He worked for Franklin Graham, the right wing evangelical. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Brantley went to West Africa with a group called Samaritan's Purse, led by Franklin Graham, to fight Ebola. Uh, he was from the middle of the country. He is conservative. As I said, he's an evangelical. Uh, and he was on one side of me in this meeting. And on the other side of me was Craig Spencer, who was a very progressive doctor from New York with uh, Doctors Without Borders, who had gone to West Africa uh, to fight the, fight the disease and had gotten the disease. And opposite of me uh, was Nina Pham, an, Afri uh, an Asian American nurse in Dallas, a young woman who had gotten the disease while treating a patient uh, in Dallas. And, you know, it just, that moment where you had people of such different views, such different parts of the country, such different perspectives, such different backgrounds, all together, um, all having done something to fight the disease. It was one of those moments where we say, well, you know, this is what really does make this country great. This is what really does make this country exceptional, that all of us can do these kinds of things. And, and that I had the pleasure of being able to talk to these people and and our response team had done something to help each one of these people and um you know that reminded me of why uh america needs to lead in the world why our what makes us truly an exceptional country is our ability to do things like that that help other people that help other countries yes it helped america too if we got rid of, a, I mean, if we get rid of Ebola in West Africa, we don't have an Ebola epidemic in America. That's in our interest. If you ever doubt that's an interest, what we're going through right now shows you what happens when a disease rages overseas and comes here. Right. That didn't happen with Ebola because we did the right thing in West Africa. But it's also just the most American thing to do, the rightest thing to do, to go help other people. We have the capacity to do it. We did do it. We saved so many lives in West Africa while protecting the American people, while having all these people from different walks of life and perspectives, genders, races, all these things together fighting this disease. And, and you know, I just think about that moment all the time and, and uh, it was just such a, I don't know, a very special moment for me. Thank you for, for all the work that you did. And, and uh, I think, you know, it's evident in, uh, in the response, you know, in, in, in the outcome of, 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 that, uh, of that crisis, how successful it was and how, um, and not only that, how bad it could have been. Um, yeah. So, so uh, you know, thank you for that. Um, thank you. And the last thing, the last thing I want to ask is, uh, and you don't have to answer this, but was there a most embarrassing thing that happened to you during the Obama Biden administration? I will say, uh, I'll say this. I don't, I, you know, I don't know if this exactly fits, but um, I, I have uh, three kids. And they're they're pretty grown up, uh, and uh, and time with them is really special and hard to get. It's hard to get everyone together, and so in March of 2010, we'd had a long planned family vacation, and um, and we wanted to take it. I mean, you know, it's just it's hard to find time to get three adult kids, and they each had a significant other person in their lives, and getting everyone together, it's just impossible. So we went and took the family vacation and uh, out of the country. And it's just so happened it was exactly when the Affordable Care Act finally passed after having worked on it for a year and a half. And it finally passed. And so uh, we're out of the country and I'm missing that. And I'm feeling a little bad about that. And then the president holds this ceremony to sign the bill. And I'm missing that, you know, cause I wanted to be with the family, wanted to be 
away with the kids. And we're at the beach and I come back and literally my cell phone has blown up because at the signing ceremony for the Affordable Care Act, Vice President Biden has leaned in and told uh, the president that getting health care coverage for all Americans is a big effing deal. And uh, <laughs> this has become like the big headline out of this whole thing. And everyone's emailing me, but what are you going to do about this? And what is he going to say? And, da, 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 da. and I've missed this entire thing. I've been completely AWOL during the entire BFD thing because I'm at the beach uh, with my children. And, 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 and um, you know, and look, I mean, uh, it was great. I'm so glad the vice president was candid about it and laid it out there. But, um, but, uh, but I missed the whole thing. That's, that's the yeah. truth of it. I missed, the, I missed it when he said it. I missed it when he responded to it. I missed the entire thing. And, uh, uh, yeah, I still get teased a little bit about that, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we look around, we have the country on fire, literally, uh, yeah. more than a hundred thousand Americans dead. We have the most polarized population in my lifetime, maybe in your lifetime. Uh, how do we heal from this? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, just from my point of view, I, I if I'm on Twitter and I, I see everything that's going on, I, I mean, maybe we've had, you know, scenarios in the past where it's been it's been polarized like this but not in my lifetime so how do we come back from this and beyond that what would a president biden be able to do to facilitate that well look i think that um polarization has always been a factor in our country and it, there are times when it's more obvious time when it's less obvious and i agree with you this is one of those times when it seems most extreme and and what particularly seems extreme about it is that we're polarized around some things that just seem crazy to be polarized around. The fact that we're having a political debate about whether or not people should be wearing masks when that's clearly what the public health people advocate, what Trump's own Surgeon General advocates, what his head of infectious diseases, Dr. Tony Fauci advocates. The fact that this has now become some political debate in our country is uh, craziness. It just is. Now, so I don't, I don't think we should overpromise an end to polarization because polarization has been a long time factor in our country. What I do think that a President Biden could deliver is strong leadership based on decency, based on doing the job, based on bringing people together. You know, he's done this before. I mean, in, when I worked for him in the Senate, uh, he was the leader in getting the ban on assault weapons passed. Think about what a polarized issue that is. Uh, you know, common sense restrictions on guns has been one of the most polarizing issues in our country. And yet he overcame that polarization and got the United States Senate and then, of course, the House and President Clinton to sign into law a ban on assault weapons. Uh, and so he's shown his ability to use his rhetorical skills, his legislative skills, his leadership skills, his persuasion skills to bring people together to get things done. Now, we're, we're never going to be in a situation where everyone accepts it. So we're never going to get the NRA to accept that. We didn't get it to accept it when we passed it. They're not going to accept it before. There'll be strong opposition. We know that. But I think good leadership based on finding ways to bring common allies together, based on a way, a way to advance an agenda with a plan and experience, I think that's what has been made Joe Biden so successful as a senator, as vice president, and will make him successful as president. And when people ask me to point to things, I mean, in addition to his record, I think just look at what's happened over the course of this presidential campaign, Brian. It was a hard fought primary campaign. We had more than two dozen people running it. We had 12, 15 really strong candidates running it from all wings of the party men, women, people of color, uh, incredible race. And people fought hard. I mean, they fought hard as they should. The presidency of the United States, was, uh, United States was at stake. But as Joe Biden won in late February and March, you saw this coming together around him of candidates like uh, ultimately Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and Amy Globuchar and people to Jig, all uniting around Joe Biden. I think that's the kind of leadership that we need. It's obviously not going to bring every American together. We are a divided country. We can't fix all that. But his ability to unify the Democratic Party rapidly and broadly, I think, speaks volumes to the kind of leadership he'd give us as president. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I really appreciate it.
Thanks for having me, Brian. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and your and your viewers and your listeners. And uh, I really am grateful for this chance to be part of this conversation. Thanks so much. And and uh, Ron, what's why don't you uh, give your social media handles too? Where can we? Yeah, where so can we find you online? Yeah, best way to find me is on Twitter at Ronald Klain. Uh, I also am the co-host of a podcast about the pandemic called Epidemic uh, with Dr. Celine Gounder. She and I do uh, two episodes a week about the epidemic. We talk about the epi pandemic itself as well as a lot of the social and policy issues around it. And you can find that podcast any place you get a podcast. So uh, thanks cool. for the chance to plug that too. Of course. All right. That was Ron Klain. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brian.